We're going to step through the phases of learning a programming language from scratch so that we have functional and working knowledge to apply to our day-to-day -day work as security practitioners. You can apply this approach to learning any new programming language, but I'll be using JavaScript as our example throughout this video. The goal here isn't mastery, but useful working knowledge so that when you need to whip up a script, fix an exploit, or review some code, you're ready to go. As always, if you enjoy the video, don't forget to like and subscribe, and let's dive in. Pardon the interruption, this video is brought to you by Vanta. Many of you, like me in the past, are responsible for your organization's security, and that means dealing with a lot of complexity, from dozens of spreadsheets and screenshots to fragmented tools and manual security reviews. Managing the requirements for modern compliance and security programs is increasingly challenging. So if you're looking for one solution, then continuous monitoring from Vanta is what you're after. Vanta is the leading trust management platform that helps you centralize your efforts to establish trust and enable growth across your organization. It automates up to 90% of the work for frameworks like SOC 2, ISO 27001, GDPR, HIPAA, etc, etc. <laughs> there are so many frameworks these days. So instead, you can focus on strategy and security, not just maintaining compliance. So to learn why over 6,000 companies partner with Vanta to automate compliance, strengthen their security posture, streamline security reviews, and reduce third-party risk, you can go to vanta.com forward slash mentor and of course there is a link in the description below. So first up, we need some core programming concepts. And if you've learned any programming languages before, you'll be able to fly through this section and just pay attention to the quirks or differences along the way. But if you're new to programming or need a refresher, then let's take a look at some of these before we move on. All right, so here we are at our VM and we're gonna quickly look at some of the basics of JavaScript. And of course, if you're not interested in JavaScript, feel free to skip ahead a bit. But if you're just starting out, then this is a good place to be. So first up, variables are used to store data values. And in JavaScript, values can be declared using var, let, or const. And the choice between these usually depends on the scope and the reusability if you need it. So for example, we have var, which has function scope and can be redeclared and updated. So I can just have var message equals Jeremy like this. And then we can have something like let, which has block scope, and this can be updated but not redeclared within the same scope. So let's let pi equals 3.14. And notice that we don't have to declare the type, and pi is definitely not 23. And here it's automatically going to detect and use the type for us. And then we have const, which is also block scope, but must be initialized at declaration and cannot be redeclared. So we can have something like const and let's say count equals 10. And if we want to test these out and make sure that this is working, we can just say, hey, console.log and we can pass in our variables. So for example, we can pass in message and let's be more consistent with these. And also close our brackets and you're getting some insight into how I write code, which is with lots and lots of syntax errors. And if we just run this, then you can see we get Jeremy 3.14 and 10 in the console. And it's important just to kind of run through the basics so that we really understand what's happening and, and what variables are and how they're used. And then of course, move on to useful projects later on. So very quickly, we want to be moving on to something that's actually functional rather than just creating variables and printing them to the console. And next up we have data types. So as I mentioned before, we don't need to declare the type of variable. So we don't need to say, hey, this is an int, this is a string, for example. And the type can change as the program is running. So the main types in JavaScript are numbers, strings, booleans, undefined, null, and symbols. And non-primitive types are objects, which are things like arrays and functions, etc. Etc. So let's take a look at some different types. So we can have age, for example. So let age equals 25, which I was 25 again. And this, of course, is a number. And then we can have let name equals Jeremy. And of course, this is a string, not a strong. And of course, we could let is registered equals true. And of course, this is a Boolean. And then of course, we could do something like let's 
address equals null. And the type of this is of course null. And then we could let job and not declare it at all. And this is undefined. And if we want to see the type of a variable, so when we're working with it, we could do something like console.log type of, and then the variable name. So here we have age, and let's just do like this to save a little bit of time. And we run this and here, you can see we have number, string, boolean, object, and undefined as we saw. And next up we have operators. And there are a few different types of operators that we need to know about. So first up we have arithmetic operators. So things like plus, minus, multiply, divide. And then of course we have comparison operators. So we have equals, equals, not equals to, uh, greater than, less than, etc., etc. And we also have logical operators like and, or, or not, for example. So we can take a look at some of these. So for example, we could let result equals 20 plus five like this, and then we could console.log result times two. And so here result is going to be 25 because of this arithmetic operator. And then we're going to multiply the result by two when we output it to the console. So hopefully we will see 50 in the console. And here we are, we get 50. And then within our application, we might want an age check. So we might have something like, hey, let is adult equals result is greater than 18. And this will of course equal true because we're still using this result and the initial value of this is 25. So if we run result is greater than 18, we're going to get true back. And then we can do something like, hey, console.log is adult and the result is less than 30. And we can combine these as well. So when we run this, we get true back here because both of these statements are true because the result, which is 25, is greater than 18 and it's less than 30. And if we did less than 20 here, for example, and run this, we get false. So understanding these logical operators is really the cornerstone of programming. And one last thing, which is to do with types. So we could do something like console.log, which is result equals equals 25. Now we know that this is a number. Now we know that this is a number and the result of the number is 25. So this should return true because we're using two equals. We're not actually doing a comparison of the type, even though this is a number and this is a string. If we wanted to do a number, we would leave out the quotes like this. So this will return true here and this will also return true. And this does lead to some interesting vulnerabilities like type juggling and loose comparison, but we can also use console.log result equals 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 25. And this also compares the types. So the values have to be the same and then the types have to be the same as well. And as you can see here, the comparison is false because the number 25 is not equal to the string 25. And of course, just to prove our point, we can take out the quotes again and then everything is back to true. And one last thing before we move on is control structures. So control structures direct the flow of a program based on conditions. And the most common types are conditional statements. So if, else, else if, and switch. And then we also have loops. So for loops, while loops, do while, for in, for of, etc., etc. And both conditional statements and loops are both really, really fundamental to programming. So let's take a quick look. So if we have let score equals 75 like this, and then we have if score is greater than or equal to 90, for example, and we open and close some curly braces, we could do something like console.log grade A. Not a score that I'm used to, unfortunately. And this is useful because we can say, hey, okay, so if the score is greater than or equal to 25, we get grade A. And we could copy and paste this and say, hey, okay, so if the score is, for example, greater than or equal to 80, and also score is less than 90, we could continue and then say, hey, this is grade B, but this is a little bit of an ugly way to do this, having lots and lots of if statements. So instead we could do something like else if, and we can open score is greater than or equal to 80. And then we could do something like else if score is greater than equal to 
70 and we can keep going like this and then of course we can put our result in here so let's say b or c and so when we run this we have a score of 75 so we should get a grade c which is good probably my average grade but obviously if we change this to 85 and run this again we get b and then if we change this to 95 top of the class we get grade a and then very quickly before we wrap up i'm just going to show you a for loop because i think for loops are really really important and probably a fundamental part of programming so if we for let i equals zero so this initiates a variable called i and then we're setting the value to the number zero and then we're going to run the loop while the value of i is less than five and then every time we run the loop we go i plus plus so we increment i by one and then let's console.log and we want something like number plus i like this and when we run this we should get 0 1 2 3 4 and we won't get 5 because this is only going to run when the variable i is less than 5 so we won't get 5 itself and as you can see in the console we get 0 1 2 3 4 5 and as you can see in the console we get 0 1 2 3 4 and then of course if we wanted to include the 5 we could go less than or equal to 5 and we get number 5 or we could do something like add an extra increment this number by 1 and then of course we'd be going to less than six and once again we get zero to six whoops i did greater than and as usual i typo things and here we are zero to five all right that's it for some of the really core fundamentals of programming languages and these concepts like operators and control operators and variables and data structures apply to pretty much every programming language. So don't get bogged down in the details. Think about the concepts and the logic behind it and you're good to go. So with these core concepts out of the way, let's take a closer look at JavaScript. First, it's an interpreted language, meaning that it's executed line by line at runtime without needing to compile it. It's also dynamically typed. So this means that types are associated with values rather than variables and the same variable can hold different types at different times. And JavaScript supports functional programming as well as object-oriented programming. You probably know that it was initially designed to run in the browser so that we can manipulate the DOM within web applications. But of course, with Node.js, we can now run JavaScript server-side and this has become steadily more popular. From a design philosophy perspective, much of JavaScript revolves around handling asynchronous events like user interactions and on the whole is a versatile language that can be used for simple scripts as well as complex server-side applications. I think it's important that when you read up on a new language or technology to do a little bit of digging into the philosophy behind it and the intentions of the creators. It's going to give you some good insights into when and why to utilize it. One last thing about JavaScript before we move on is that JavaScript runs with a single thread but uses asynchronous behavior. So this means that it has a single threaded execution model but uses callbacks, promises, and async and await to handle operations that might block that single thread. And with that out of the way, let's take a look at some simple projects that we might build to get our head around the syntax and solidify a foundation that we can build on top of when we explore more complex topics or features within the language itself. When building your first project, I want to lay out a few ideal constraints. First, it should be an hour or less because you're going to be learning a bunch of new things and you want those concepts to come together as an end product before taking on other new concepts or complexity. Put another way, we want to learn something and see its impact before learning something else. Otherwise, we will get lost in complexity. Second, I recommend following along with some tutorials or guides that are free, but include explanations of the code. And finally, if you can, build something in context so that you can understand where it fits and how it interacts with the environment around it. So for example, with Java, JavaScript, once we're past the very basics, instead of just typing commands into the console, try to build a small application. This will put you much further ahead in terms of your understanding. And I'm going to recommend this video and playlist. No need to go through all of them, but the weather app in particular, I think is a great one to get started with as you'll gain a load of new skills and insights with not just JavaScript, but also APIs and CSS and HTML and building small applications as a whole. This is a 
great place to start and like I say, not too complicated and should take you about an hour. Once we have a couple of projects out of the way, it's time to dig deeper and work on our ability to write, troubleshoot and review our own code as well as the code of others. And the biggest thing I find between those that are confident with programming and those that shy away from writing code is the willingness to read documentation. More often than not, it's easy to find a rough working example of something that we need for our project, but being able to understand technical documentation is going to help you when you have an edge case or a weird situation or when you're doing code review and you need to know precisely what's going on, not just trying to get the code to run without errors. And really for a lot of security practitioners, then this is enough. Working knowledge and the ability to understand and troubleshoot code, we're by no means software engineers at this point and nor should we try to become one unless that's something that you're really interested in then of course go for it but for security engineering and pen testing and even appsec working knowledge is often enough and gives us a huge return on the time investment to get to this point i would say that you should try and dedicate a little bit of time to continue your learning and make sure that you stay sharp but no need to go nuts having a small side project or doing some regular code review is probably enough for most of us and that's it for this video I hope this guide helps you into picking up new and valuable skills that you can use in your cybersecurity career. Catch you next time.